when you look in our society, we live in a time when we have the ability to be more connected globally than ever before. Yet for some reason, we seem to be more divided. Like it's an us versus them kind of mentality. You have things, you have black versus white. You have Democrat and Republican. You have Christian, you have non-Christian. You have us versus them. And there's so many things in this world that we try and divide ourselves from. But I think God has something different and something better for all of us. You know, a study was done in Harvard to say, you know what, what is one of the keys to human happiness? What you realize is what they found is not that shocking. They said it was not wealth. It was not being able to work hard. It was not even fame that attributed to human happiness. But the big thing was relationships. Relationships. And a number of human studies were done on this. Okay, and both genders. And it points to the positive influence on people and the positive impact of nurturing relationships on physical and psychological health has to do with relationships. Okay, great. We just covered that. Here's the staggering part. On the flip side, social rejection in human activities activates the same part of our brain as does physical pain. Social rejection activates the same part of your brain and my brain as does physical pain. What you've got to recognize is as a follower of Christ, as someone in part of this world, we have a responsibility to love the people around us. You know, there's this really cool news story about a young boy, a six-year-old boy who felt bullied in kindergarten, okay? Like, that's just kind of sad. Felt bullied in kindergarten. Felt like he couldn't really make friends. So the next year when he decided to go to school, he decided he was going to make a shirt for himself because the way that he felt was so alone and so sad, he didn't want anyone else to ever feel that way again. So he made a shirt that said, I will be your friend. I will be your friend. And he wore this to school on the first day so that everyone would know, no matter what, no matter where you come from, I'm here for you, I got your back. And it's great because in a little kid, we can say, man, that's cool, that's admirable, that's so cute, we had some awes. But somehow we grow up, and not in a good way. And we lose that attitude. We find that us versus them mentality. That's not what God has for us. That's not God's best for you and for me. Let me let you in on a little secret. If you and I were 100% honest with each other, we would be real on the fact that we need relationships. God created us for that need. Maybe some of you only need a few key relationships and others of us, we need many more relationships, but we all have that need for relationships. So we're gonna challenge the way we look at being a friend to someone else tonight. Because what if being a follower of Christ isn't about the value others can add to your life, but about being a friend to others as God has commanded us to in his word, in his word, absolutely. So what we're gonna do right now is Switch is gonna look a little bit different right now. The message is gonna feel a little bit different because we're gonna look at a story within a story, a story within a story. And this is something that Jesus actually answered, a religious scholar who had these questions for Jesus. They're always trying to trap him. And, And it can be found in Luke chapter 10. And the story goes, master, Jesus, teacher, What do I need to do to get eternal life? And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told the man, do this and you'll live. But the religious man Looking 
for a loophole, asked Jesus, just how would you define a neighbor? How would you define a neighbor? So Jesus goes on to tell a story of a man who was traveling along this road. And he was actually um, mugged. He was mugged. He was beaten up. All his things were stolen. He was left on the side of the road for dead. Then what happens? The story goes, a priest comes walking by. When he sees the man, instead of walking towards him to see if he was okay, it said he cut catty corner across the road to steer clear of that man. Okay, a priest. That's messed up. When you say, that's messed up. Then another person came by. This one was a Levite. A Levite were supposed to be the good guys, the best of the best of the Jewish people. He walks up, same kind of response, just keeps on going. That pretends like he doesn't even know that guy exists. And lastly, in Jesus' story, a Samaritan comes by. And to the Jewish people, the Samaritans were despised. They, they were not friends. They were against us. It was us versus them. He wasn't supposed to stop and help a Jewish man, but that's exactly what he did. He saw him. He saw him where he was at. He saw him in his pain. His heart went out to him. He picked him up, loaded him on his donkey, took the man to an inn. And you can say, man, that's really awesome, but God didn't stop there. The Samaritan said, Hey, Mr. Innkeeper, here's this money. I'm going to pay for this man to become well. And if he incurs any more charges, add it to my bill and I will pay you when I return. That's loving somebody. After Jesus told the story, he asked the religious guy, which of these was the best neighbor? The guy replied, well, the one, the one that helped him. The one that helped him. Jesus said, now go and do likewise. And that in itself is a really great story. But I imagine if Jesus were to tell that same story today, it might look a little bit different. It would go something like this. And as I tell this story, I want you to pay attention and see which person you are, who you identify with. And we'll talk about it at the end. One day, a kid by the name of Charlie went to a new school. He was to himself. He didn't know anybody. Every day he walked around from class to class, AirPods in, listening to music. He really kept to himself. At first, people tried to reach out to him. They tried to get to know him, get to know his story. But Charlie just kind of wanted to keep his distance. He was a loner. He was okay with being alone. He felt like he didn't need anyone. So eventually, people just kind of started to get tired of his attitude. Like, you know what? Who is this guy? Maybe he just thinks he's better than everybody else. So people started to talk and say stuff about Charlie. One day, a group of, guy, a group of guys said, you know what? Charlie's the perfect kind of a person to have a little bit of fun with. So they said, at the end of the day, we're just going to beat him up. It could be good. It could be good to get video of. It could be funny. He, no one really cares for him. So we're going to have some fun with the guy. Word started to get around school that this was going to happen to Charlie. And a straight-A student hears about this. She hears about Charlie's situation, and she thinks to herself, my classmates are so immature. I cannot believe that they would do something like this. But her being a straight-A student, being focused first and foremost on her grades, said, you know what? I got to distance myself from this. So she spent all afternoon in the library so she could study. Because to her, getting the best grades was the most important thing. The day went on, and the time had finally come for Charlie to get what, what these guys thought was he was going to deserve. He walks into the bathroom. They get him in there. And just about that time, as everything's about to go down, a switch student walks in through the bathroom doors. He sees this commotion. He sees guys out with their phones ready to press record. In his moment, he thinks, man, I've been getting an awful lot of tardies lately. If I get one more tardy, my mom said I'm going to be grounded. If I get grounded, no phone, no fun weekend with my friends. I might not even be able to go to switch. So the switch student weighs the possibilities, quietly steps out of the bathroom and hurries up to class. Then a random student starts making that way. It was too late. The guys grab Charlie. 
they hit him. They threw him to the ground. They started kicking him, making him bloody and bruised and embarrassing him. And this random student walks in through the door and says, hey, cut that out. Stop. What are you guys doing? He doesn't deserve this. And as soon as he spoke, it's like the veils dropped from everyone's eyes and they scurried out of the bathroom. And this random student walks over to Charlie. He picks him up. Man, I'm sorry. He hangs out with him. He gets him cleaned up. But I don't just get him cleaned up and get him home for the rest of the day. Something sticks out to him. He says, you know what? I need to be there for this guy. So slowly, day after day, he starts to build a relationship. And it takes time. But he ends up becoming friends with Charlie. Not just this one-time help charity case, but decides to make him a part of his friend group. And about this time is where I think Jesus would end the story. And he would ask you, which of these students was the best neighbor to Charlie? And the thing is, the answer is quite obvious. But what you got to recognize, just because it's obvious doesn't mean we're automatically going to do the right thing. I believe there's three lessons we can learn quickly from the Good Samaritan or this random switch student. One, Friendship is being available. You see, we have every opportunity, whether it's in person, at school, in our activities, or online, to be available to help those that are there, that are existing, that have needs, that are hurting or feel lonely on the inside. But sometimes we get so caught up, so busy with our own life, our own direction, our own plan of what I need to achieve to get here, and you could be missing out on the very people God is asking you to love and to reach out to Number two, friendship is having compassion. The good Samaritan didn't just see the man, but he allowed his heart to go out to him. What you got to recognize about compassion is this is a quality that drove Jesus to do everything. From when he walked into a room and saw someone hurting, saw someone sick, he reached out and said, I can heal you. And he said, be well. When he walked and saw a widow whose son had passed away, Jesus had compassion on her and he raised her son from the dead. Come on, Swiss. When Jesus, when Jesus stepped into a place and he saw and had compassion, he didn't just have compassion, but he did something about it. With that same compassion, he fed 5,000 people. You see, what you got to recognize, Switch, is having compassion is one thing. Then doing an action step with it is a whole nother thing. But that action step is what leads to the miracles in someone else's life that God wants you to be a part of. And the third thing, being a friend means meeting people where they're at. People are messy. They're hurting. They're broken, sometimes bloody and boozed and and, and beaten. Maybe they have a lot of baggage from past relationships. Maybe they do have a history of being a gossip, but you got what you got to recognize is God's calling you to love them where they're at. You see right there in this story, God said, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. But he didn't stop there because Jesus raised the bar one step further. He didn't say just love your neighbor as yourself, but he said, you should love people the way I have loved you. And the way Jesus loved you and me is by laying his life down for us. That's what we are called to do, Switch. That is what being a good Samaritan looks like. And you've got to recognize that you have the power. Just one word. Just one positive interaction online, playing video games, commenting on someone else's posts can have so much of an impact on someone else's life that you may not fully understand until you reach heaven one day. Let's pray. God, I thank you for all of us here in this room. I thank you that we have a purpose. God, that we can be a real friend that we can be available, that we can have compassion, and we can meet people where they're at. And right now there's people in this room and everywhere else watching online, knowing that you can use us. You can use us to make a difference in other people's life. So God, for those of us that need to have compassion, for those of us that need to remember to be available and look at people around us, For those of us that need the boldness to step out and meet people where they're at, no matter how messy it can be, I pray 
that you can just give us that boldness. And for those of us who want me to pray for them right now, raise your hand high in this room. Yeah, there's hands going up all over the place. God, I thank you for these incredible young leaders. God, I thank you that they recognize that they have influence and that you can use them where they're at to make a difference. Not just by loving other people because that's what you tell us to do, but loving other people because it's what you've showed us. That's who you are. Let us be that reflection. With every head still bowed and every eye still closed, there's another group of you in this room. Because earlier I asked you to pay attention and see who you felt like you were in this story. And the truth is, that in the story of the Good Samaritan, at some point in our lives, you and I are every single one of the characters. But what you gotta recognize is at one point, we were all broken and in need of a savior. That's where Jesus comes in. That's where he modeled what his love looks like because his love is nothing you and I can earn or it's nothing we deserve, but he gives it to us freely because his love for us is so big, so grand that we can barely even comprehend it. But all we have to do is confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. And that same love that rose Christ from the dead is available to you and to me right now. So switch in this moment. You've been to switch before. It could be your first time, but whatever the case, right now you're ready. You feel God calling you forward, saying, yes, it's your time, and you can feel it welling up inside of you. You don't have to pay attention to your friend next to you because God's grace is here, and it's available, and it starts with a simple act, and the act is by raising your hand. So for those of you in this room ready to receive God's grace, his love, his forgiveness, and start a new life with him, raise your hand high right now.